Welcome back to Man vs. Meeple, the show where we talk about all things board game related. Today we're talking about a brand new game called Sagrada by Floodgate Games. It is a 1-4 to four player, 30 minute experience that plays ages 13 and up. Yeah, 13 and up, I'd say maybe even a little lower. This is a great yeah. accessible game and a great introductory to dice drafting for sure. Yeah, so the game is based around the Sagrada Familia, which is a very beautiful church in Spain that's known for its architecture. And stained glass. And its stained glass <laughs> windows, of course. So in this game, players are going to be uh, building their own stained glass window with colored dice, five different colored yep. dice, which will be placing in their window in unique patterns to score points. Right. Everyone's going to be scoring points in similar fashions. Uh, yet everyone does also have a secret objective to score points as well. Plus, there are some placement rules that yeah. make the game a very satisfying puzzle every turn. That's right. So let's walk you through the components real quick. At the start of the game, each player will be dealt one private objective. There are five private objectives in the game, and they're all for placing particular colored dice in their window frame. Right. Uh, each of these give you points depending upon the number of pips that you have of that caller at the end of the game. Uh, then players will be dealt window frames. They'll actually get two different window frames which are double sided. Uh, once they know the color of their objective, they can pick these. Um, they're going to pick one of these window frames and then pick one side of them to use. Now there's two important features on these window frames. One is the colors and the numbers. Uh, when you're placing dice through the future of the game, you'll have to place light colored uh, dice on those locations, and then pips of those numbers, and those can be any color. Right. Uh, you're going to place that actually into your frame, and it slides right into the bottom of your window frame. Also on the bottom of each of these window frames, uh, you have favor tokens, and these favor tokens are these crystals here that allow you to manipulate the dice through tool cards in the game. Exactly, and that's going to vary depending on what card you take, and that's also related to sort of the difficulty of that card, because as I said earlier, there are placement rules that make this a little tricky. It's not as simple as picking a card randomly yeah. because you need you can't place like numbers next to each other or like colors next to each other. Uh, you also have some public objectives. Um, in addition to the three tools that you always have, you'll have three public objectives, and these are asking players to do sets of numbers or uh, particular patterns or diagonals on the board that will give you victory points at the end of the game, depending upon those patterns and the number that's associated with them. Right. Um, you have a round track, which also on the backside is a score track. Once the game is done, you're going to be playing through 10 rounds in the game. And then, of course, you have your colored die. And yep. there's 90 dice that are placed into the bag, and they're randomly brought out by the first player, depending upon the number of players, and rolled at the start of every round, and then drafted. That's the that's the main meaty portion of the game. Yeah. So you're going to be playing over 10 rounds, uh, starting with the first player. That player is going to pull an X number of dice from the bag, depending upon the number of players. We have a four-player game, so we have nine dice that were drafted. They're going to roll those dice at the start, and then a draft starts in a snake fashion. So starting with the first player, they're going to pick one of those dice, and then around the table, and then snake back around to that first player again. Now, as David alluded to, there's some placement rules in this game that you <laughs> have to know. The very first die that you have to place in the very beginning of the game has to be around the edge of the board or on the corners. Again, you have to follow the rules of the game. Colored dice have to be placed in those particular colors on your window frame, and dice that have pip numbers on them have to be placed in those specific pip numbers on your board. Yeah. Now, there's some other rules here that are very important to make sure that you follow um, because the game gets progressively harder as you go. Absolutely. One, you get yourself in a jam, for you, sure. You can. <laughs> One, you can never place two dice next to each other that have the the same pip number and that is orthogonally so you can't have a six next to a six or a five next to a five also you cannot have the same colored dice next to each other orthogonally <laughs> so you can't have a yellow next to a yellow anytime you place a die you're allowed to place anywhere adjacent to any die that you currently have on the board right including and, diagonal including diagonal yes yeah the the, the dice play, placement gets a little interesting because the other thing you have to remember the colors are easy easy to see on these stained glass windows, but the pip numbered spaces, if there's a five and you happen to use a five in one of the white spaces, and I don't think we said the white spaces, you can place any die. Yeah, that's right. But if you were to place, say, a four next to that four, you've just blocked yourself blocked out. Yourself. Yeah. So unless there's a card that allows you to move some dice around, and there are some things like that potentially in the game, you've basically blocked yourself out of fulfilling that one space. Uh, once it snakes back around to the first player, 
Uh, the last die that's available, and there will always be one die available, that goes onto the round track, signifying that that round is now done. Um, now, one thing you can do at any time during your turn is you can also ask for a favor from the church, and that's by using a tool. There's always three tools that are available to all the players, and you'll be using your favor tokens. Again, those favor tokens are granted once and once only at the start of the game, depending upon how difficult your window is. You can place one of these favor tokens on any one of these three cards to enact that ability, and that allows you to manipulate the dice in particular ways, put dice back in the bag, re-roll dice, and right. so forth. But again, now, these things, they're not the same three every game, so no. you can't always rely on that same tool that you used the last game to be able to manipu manipulate your dice. Now, the trick in these favor cards is that once one player places a favor on them as such, every player then out for the rest of the game has to place two on there. So it becomes progressively harder to use the favors if you don't go to them early. But you don't typically want to go to them early because as the game progresses, it gets harder and harder to place the die that you need to place in order to meet your private objective as well as the public objectives. And these let you like manipulate right. those dice a little better. So going to them later in the game is way more beneficial than early game. Well, and plus those are um, unused ones are points at, Our the, points end of at the, the, the end of the game. So yeah, you, like Jeremy said, you want to hold on to those things, of course, unless you make a bonehead move like I have done at the beginning of a game and really need to make some adjustments before it gets too costly out there. Once a round is over play just moves to the next player in clockwise fashion. They start as a first player, and it progresses over 10 rounds. Once 10 rounds is done, you start adding up the points. Now, here's how the points work. Every favor token that a player has is worth one victory point at the end of the game. Every window pane that is not covered by a die loses that player right. one victory point. Uh, public objective cards will score out depending upon if players meet those objectives. For instance, one of the ones we have here on the left says that if a column has four different colored dice in that location, they will score five victory points for each column that they have. Right. Um, and the last one is their private objective. Uh, for instance, I have the purple private objective. So for every purple die that I have, the pip count is how many points I will score. So if I'm placing a lot of sixes on the board that are purple, they can give me a lot of victory points at the end of the game. Yeah, this is an interesting part of the game because you're, you're wanting to definitely keep track of what other players are doing. Yeah. And if I see Jeremy picking up every high-value purple die throughout the game, I might get a sense that he has the purple objective card. That also kind of plays into some of these public obje objective cards because right now we have a card that you, gives you points, uh, two points for every pair of a one and a two. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's going to sort of contradict taking high-value pips, uh, yep. pip dice. So uh, let's get into the review. Yeah, absolutely. I I really like a lot of things about the game. The art style obviously is going to draw people in right away. Oh, it's, it's a beautiful, gorgeous, beautiful looking game, game. Beautiful box. The dice are very colorful. These components are amazing. Yeah, having the recessed boards and having the dice fit in those locations and having the <laughs> slide in there to give the players the variability at the start right. is really, really good. Um, I like the tools. I like any kind of game that allows you to manipulate your dice. I hate dice that once you roll them, it is what it is. And this game has a lot of those options, but it doesn't have too many. So you are very, very beholden by how many favor tokens you have. So you have to use them strategically throughout the course of the game. But the game plays really fast. So you're playing this in 30 minutes, so it doesn't outlast its welcome by any means. No, absolutely not. And I think also, even, even without the tools, just the fact that it is a dice drafting game helps... Uh, lower the impact of yeah. or the negative impact of luck. Yeah, you know because you're drafting your dice. So if you're not if you don't see exactly what you want on any given turn, you can kind of look around your board and find a spot for some of the dice that are out there. Yeah. Generally, except when it comes down to the end of the game sometimes, and you just need that green four and yeah. can't roll it. Uh, the other thing I really like about this game is how the game gradually ramps up. I love the puzzle aspect of trying to both meet your private objective, but also trying to fulfill these public objectives while you're trying to manage this board that is locking you down. You have to be very, very uh, thoughtful by the way you place your dice because oh, yeah. you can lock yourself out of positions by placing, as David said very early uh, in the video, that if you place a number in the wrong location that locks you out of a caller that you need to go to, you're in trouble, right? and you're going to have to use your tools at that point. The only thing that I don't like about the game, and this may just be me, is that I feel like after you've played this game, I don't know, four or five times, you will have seen everything that you possibly can see. There's only 12 tools. 
There's five public objectives, all are private objectives. All the private objectives are for colors. So it, there's no variance in that other than trying to meet a very specific color. And then there are uh, 10 public objectives. I feel like with one media expansion that allows for more variety in your private objectives, it could be a very good game. I would agree with the fact that it, it's ripe for expansions. Yes. Like you could just continually come out with more window pane cards, yes. more tools, all sorts of different things. I still think, though, at the end of the day, the game, while some of those variable elements you can get through in a few games mm-hmm. pretty easily, the game itself, because you're drafting dice, because you're rolling dice, that's going to be different every sure. time, because you can take so many different things during any given game, it definitely has a lot of replayability, in my opinion. Plus, I think one of the greatest things about this game is it's extraordinarily access- accessible. Yeah. This is a great gateway game. It's beautiful to look at. Anyone can play this. Like, I think so, too. I mean, I think I think an eight-year-old who can obviously read could play this game. Yeah, you're going to screw much... I mean, they, they're going to screw up, but that's part yeah. of the fun of solving these puzzles yeah. is placing dice and learning from that. And I think... This doesn't punish you too much for doing that. Yeah. Um, a great opportunity to teach kids, you know, some of the new the nuances of a game like this, particularly with these tools and how you can use things to manipulate, you know, mistakes you've made. Yeah, beautiful looking game, guys. This is Sagrada yeah. by Floodgate Games. Uh, congratulations to them. It looks gr- absolutely stunning yeah. on the table. Uh, if you guys have any questions, make comments below. Please subscribe to us as always. Follow us on Twitter, Follow like us on, us on Facebook, yep. and everything else that we do here at Man vs. Meeple. And we will catch you guys next time. Bye bye.